Those of us who grew up nourished only by monthly glimpses of these impossible beings now live in a world of superheroes. Their images are everywhere. Life becomes manga. The comic heroes have found their true home in our streets, on our TVs and movie screens, and wrapped around our public transport. How did it happen? What really opened the floodgate for this flamboyant intonation of fluorescent regalia, alphabet suits, and goth noir? Who distilled the power of Kirby, the elegance of Toth and Raymond, the vigor and passion of Adams, the chiaroscuro classicism of Steranko into a magnificent popular vision of the comic book character as a contemporary animated hero and made it shine for a mass audience? Who gave us a Batman with all the excitement, grit, and edgy pulp romance of the modern comics and none of the psychological hang-ups, setting the template for the superhero action movies of the 21st century? That's a quote from Grant Morrison in 2004. And by the way, you're welcome. I resisted the urge to imitate his accent. But the man he's talking about, as you might have guessed, is none other than comic and animation legend Bruce Timm. Bruce Timm was born in Oklahoma on February 5, 1961. When he was in his early teens, he developed an interest in both comics and drawing. He recounts, When I was 13, there was this guy in the street that had a drawer full of comics his cousin had given him, and he said, You want them? I said, Sure. He had just a little bit of everything. One of them was a Marvel's Greatest Comics reprint with the first Black Panther story. That probably was actually the first Kirby comic I ever got. Actually, in the same drawer full of comics, there were a couple of Mr. Miracles and The Demon, so that kind of put the zap on my head. While Tim has developed a unique and often imitated style of his own, the Kirby influence remains in his drawings to this day. There are a lot of great comic artists that do a pretty good take on Kirby's style for retro books, but for my money, Steve Rude and Bruce Tim are the best by far. You can see the influence, of course, but they build upon it in a way that's unique and additive. But back to Tim's career. In the mid-80s, he found himself working at Kmart when he saw an ad for Filmation, the animation studio. It took a couple attempts, but he was eventually hired by Filmation and other studios, and contributed some of the greatest cartoons of the decade. He-Man and the Masters of the Universe, She-Ra, G.I. Joe, The Real Ghostbusters, Tiny Toons, and The Secret of Nim. But he hadn't abandoned comics. During this period, he also drew the He-Man mini-comics that came with the figures. While it's early work, I think it's still very strong, and shows great character work and solid storytelling. He was also doing samples for Marvel. He was told his work wasn't quite up to par yet, but continued to do inking samples over artists like Larry Stroman and John Bogdanov, and his work was, like the He-Man comics, very different than what would become the classic Bruce Timm style. He was also coloring for first comics in between animation jobs. I'm guessing you know what happens next, Batman the Animated Series. Tim and Eric Radomski got a chance to give audiences a new take on the Dark Knight's world, and were so successful that it's still being used to different degrees today in animation and comics. There are a lot of videos out there that go into the animated series and the production's history, and as awesome as that stuff is, in this video I'm taking a closer look at his comics work. Once Batman the Animated Series found its well-deserved success, there was a huge demand to bring that version of the character and Tim's artwork into the comics. The first comic based on the animated series by Tim was Mad Love, a look at Joker and Harley's relationship written by Paul Dini. It's a masterclass in storytelling. He's recounted in interviews that it took some work to adjust to a comic page layout from the animation-focused boards he usually produced, but it looks effortless. He also hand-colored page guides for the final colors. Other artists did a great take on the Tim style for the monthly comic but it was great to see a comic Tim and handled from pencils to color. Unsurprisingly, it won the Eisner and Harvey Awards in 1994 for Best Single Issue War Story, and it's still considered a classic. Tim continued to create covers when his schedule allowed, while also running the Batman animated series and later Superman, Freakazoid, and the Justice League, as well as several classic animated movies featuring the characters. An annual of the Batman Adventures comics featuring the demon is a personal favorite of mine, and really let him use that Kirby influence I mentioned earlier to great effect. One thing I want to point out that's really remarkable about Bruce Timm's popularity is that his style was really embraced at a time when comic art was going in a very, very different direction. The initial image creators, who I'm a big fan of, pushed comic art in a very different direction than it had been in the mid-80s, 
And more than that, the second and third wave of image creators push that in-your-face, highly rendered style in ever more extreme directions. And I'm not knocking that. I love that stuff. But it got to the point where Marvel and DC's books reflected that as well. The character designs, page layouts, and rendering in mid-90s comics were the pinnacle of what I'd call the image style. And unlike the original image creators, some of the imitators didn't have the fundamentals and anatomy or storytelling that, say, Jim Lee or Mark Silvestri had, producing some very out-there artwork. But even when this style of comics was at its zenith, comics fans really embraced Tim's work and his takes on well-established characters. Unlike the art I mentioned earlier, his character designs, rendering, and storytelling were a complete 180 from the work the mid-90s is known for. He emphasized what was truly classic about Batman and other characters. That, the concentration on what was classic about these characters and their worlds, is what I think makes his style as enduring and as popular as it has been. It's just solid, fun comic book art. It's a shame he didn't have time to do more comics work. He was asked once, could you do a monthly book and stay on schedule? He responded, if it was my main gig, I probably could. It depends on what book it was, and if I was teamed up with a good writer who kept me excited and inspired. I don't know how long I'd be able to keep it up. I think I could handle a monthly book, but living in Los Angeles, I'm not sure I could survive on the pay of just one monthly book. He elaborated, there'd also be a problem with doing a monthly book. I would get bored because I have so many interests. I've done my Captain America story. I've done my Vampirella story. I've done my romance story. I still want to do a Conan. I'm a huge Conan fan. But I don't think I could do Conan on a monthly basis. I don't think I could do Batman on a monthly basis. It would have to somehow incorporate all the things I'm interested in. Pretty girls, monsters, superheroes, guys with guns, and barbarians. If there was some book that had all of that in it, I could do it. Because of that, most of what he's produced since the 90s are covers and short stories for anthologies. A very dark take on Two-Face was seen in a short story for the Batman Black and White Anthology, which finds a reformed Harvey Dent entangled with twins that bring out his darker self. What's also great is a lot of the comic book work he was able to do at this point reflected his animation style. He recounted, I definitely think animation has influenced my comics work. Strangely enough, there was quite a bit of back and forth between Batman the Animated Show and the Batman Animated Comics. We did the style for the animation, and then DC, I think, made a really smart choice in trying to adapt the animated style for the comic. I, in turn, was influenced a lot by what Ty Templeton and Rick Burchett and Mike Parabek were doing in the comics. Before I'd done Batman the Animated Series, every time I'd tried to do a comic book, I was still stuck in not knowing who I was, trying to be Dave Stevens and Mike Golden and Jack Kirby and Mole Simonson, all at the same time. I thought, that's what comic book work looked like. If I was ever going to get comic book work, that's what I had to draw like. Fortunately, the styles have changed so drastically over the last 10 years that even mainstream guys like DC and Marvel are much more accepting of more stylized artwork than they were. If you're a fan of comic art like I am, be sure to like this video and subscribe. I'll have a lot more deep dives into the legendary artist whose work inspires us, and that's the best way to make sure you see it. Also, you can click on the link tree in the description right below to take a look at the comics this art inspired me to make. We Are Scarlet Twilight is a pulp-influenced thriller inspired by Batman and other heroes of the 30s and 40s. It's a combination of the Art Deco atmosphere of Golden Age comics with all the best stuff we expect to see in comics today. And my other book, August, is an 80s-inspired sci-fi space opera with some spaghetti western thrown in. If you're a fan of Star Wars, Transformers, He-Man, any of that stuff, this is the book for you. I tried to make it feel like something awesome from the late 80s that you get to go back and read for the first time. You can check out both of these at the link below. Single issues, collections, or live campaigns. And let's get back to the video. A Captain America short story where Cap fights a werewolf is a great, Kirby-inspired take on the character. Initially, he didn't really want to do that story. He says, It was coming down to the wire, and I just said, Fine, I'll just do it. I had to take time off from work to do it. I used some of my vacation days. I actually penciled the whole thing out in a day. A very, very intense day. It took a couple of weeks to ink it. Ultimately, I think it's really good. I think it's a really good story. I don't know what my objection to it was at first, because I look at it now and it's a neat little story. It was an opportunity to draw one of my favorite characters. I love Captain America. I was specifically trying not to make it a Kirby parody or homage, but if I draw Captain America any other way, it doesn't look right. It was an instance of me channeling Kirby without swiping from him. There are Kirby-ish touches on him, but it's not a direct Kirby homage. 
and Tim took a more extensive crack at Cap in the Avengers, in Avengers 1.5, and, and the later Earth's Mightiest Heroes series, sometimes producing the art himself, and other times collaborating with other artists. Tim has continued to do the odd cover here and there when his animation schedule allows. As I'm sure you know, he's been producing DC animated movies consistently since Batman the Animated Series began back in the 90s, and I'm really pumped to see what his newest effort, the Cape Crusader series coming out on Amazon this year, looks like. I hope you've enjoyed this deep dive into Bruce Timm's comic art. Let me know in the comments your favorite Bruce Timm art or series, and who you'd like me to feature in future videos. Until next time, keep reading those comics.